Start Oops, the recording. Should... Okay. Oh, sorry. Where to go, Abe? Good job, Abe. Uh, I'm Wayne Miller, board member. Amy Rivera, board member. Ted Agus, board member. Ryan McSherry, board council. I'm Matthew Wood, board oh, nice supervisor. Sorry, Phil. Sorry. You go first. All right, Philip Motto, Board Administration. Thank you. I'm Matthew Wojcik, LNI Supervisor. Uh, Thomas Rybikowski, City of Philadelphia, License and Inspections. Okay, uh, the uh, appellant, could you please raise your right hand? Swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. It's fine. I you. affirm. Excuse me? I affirm. Affirm, okay, okay, good. Uh, who's that, Donna? Yes. Are you in the are you in case number one? 4515 uh King Sussing? No, I'm in 5214 Walnut. Okay, we'll get you we'll get you next time, okay? Because we're doing okay. the King Sussing first, but thank you. Oh. All right. Uh Phil, want to put the case into the record, please? Yes, sir. This is case number one on today's list, MI2022-005656 for the property located at 4515 King Sessing Avenue. The appellant is Augustus Riley. Mr. Riley, are you here today? Yes, I am. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right, Tom, do you want to let us know a little bit about this case? Uh, so what we have is we have the property at 4515 King Sessing Avenue had been declared uh, unsafe due to uh, descaling or delamination of the uh, uh, brickwork along the left-hand side of the property. Uh, in speaking with the appellant, uh, Prior to today's hearing, uh, Mr. Riley, uh, I believe we spoke on Monday. Um, there was a little bit of a communication or a little bit of difference between the left and right side of the property. Um, but now uh, both are uh, in agreement or, or uh, have seen what the uh, department is looking for. In the appeals uh, paperwork, it says need more time for repairs. Please clarify a left side in violation notice. Uh, basically, it's the left-hand side breezeway masonry wall uh, that's in question. Um, and in speaking to Mr. Riley, we are uh, in agreement, or at least I was uh, going to propose to the board that he obtain a contractor and a make safe permit for the repair of the brickwork, which he had, he did say that some of the work has been completed, um, but we're looking for a permit uh, to be pulled by a contractor uh, within the next 60 days. Okay, uh, fine. Mr. Riley, you okay with that? I am in agreement. End of story. Okay. Well, Thank uh, you, sir. Ted and Amy, you're on board, right? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. All right, no problem. Good luck, guys. Thank you, sir. Am I done? Oh, you're done. You are done. Thank you. This ain't the city you're working with. This is other people running besides the city. <laughs> you, need to run, you need to run for mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Riley. You're welcome. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Okay. All right. All right. Are you ready for the next case? Yeah, we certainly are. Um, Ms. Riley, are you there? Because we're ready to start your case. Okay. Miss Riley, there she is. Okay. Miss Riley, unmute yourself. Good. Are you ready, Miss Riley, for the case? Yes, I am. Okay, here we go. I'm Wayne Miller, board member. Amy Rivera, board member. Ted Agus, board member. Ryan McSherry, board council. Philip Motto, board's administration. I'm Matthew Wojcik, LNI supervisor. Thomas Rybikowski, City of Philadelphia, license and inspections. Ms. Riley, could you please raise your right hand? Uh, swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Uh, and if you could respond, because in the, in the, you're the witness. 
I'll affirm it, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, uh, Bill, could you put that into the record? Yes, sir. This is case number two on today's list, MI-2023-002876 for the property located at 5214 Walnut Street. The appellant is Donna Riley. Mrs. Riley is in the room. Good. Bob, could you tell us a little bit about this case? Uh, so what we have is we have the property at 5214 Walnut Street. It has been uh, declared eminently dangerous by the department. It follows a inspection that occurred in April of 2023. Uh, prior to that, there was an unsafe case that was issued to the property uh, for the deterioration of that, that property uh, going back to 2019. And then following the inspection in April, uh, the property was declared as eminently dangerous as it continued to degrade. Um, with that, I would share my screen uh, and show a few photos of the property. Right. Um, but essentially, uh, what I would be petitioning to the board is that um, the appellant is making the uh, appeal uh, for uh, additional time needed to comply. What we would be looking for is a uh, engineer uh, to survey the property and then um, uh, provide a report and then a make safe permit. And what we would be petitioning the board is for a make safe permit uh, to be entered in our system within the next 30 days. Uh, but with that, I'll share my screen and um, and then take it from there. Can everybody see my screen? We do now. Okay. So I have the property here. And in the interest of time, I'll go straight to the photographs uh, that are uh, on the on it. Uh, the violation um, is, is for the rear of the property. Um, also the roofing, uh, the roof materials of the of the property itself. Uh, and then these are the photographs that were taken. I'll uh, rotate them so that we can see the property itself. Oh, okay. So we have the front of the property along 5214 Walnut, uh, but on the side of the property, you can see there's a breach in the masonry wall. Um, and then uh, there's issues with the roof line. Uh, there's also another section where there's a wall, uh, where there's a window, uh, where the brickwork is starting to fail above that window. And then you have uh, another uh, vantage point of the property where uh, more masonry or brickwork is failing above a second story window. And then you have more material that's falling off the property over uh, where this uh, cinder block has been added to the side. Um, but you have other material falling off the property. Um, with that, we would be looking for a permit within uh, 30 days. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, Ms. Riley, uh, it's up to you now. What do you have to say? Oh, well, <clears throat> excuse me. Actually, um, this is the first that I'm actually seeing this. This is my mother's property. And um, she died in, May, in in early part of May of 20, um, 2022. So I'm just becoming aware of the situation and I would have to have a little more time to find out who I could get to do what. Um, I've been approached uh, to sell the property and I have an agreement of sale, but within that agreement, the buyer is agreeing to, to um, do whatever needs to be done in order to make the property safe. So I don't know where I need to go from, from there. Okay. So if I could just add a little bit and just for clarity, Ms. Riley, when is the agreement of sale? Um, the agreement of sale was um, signed in April and they're trying to close by the end of May, but it's an issue of title right now. The latest, update that I got because um, actually I needed to sell the property in order to cover my mother's medical expenses. So there's a lien on it. So, you okay. know, they're, they're trying to clear the title. 
I understand. So what I propose to the board is um, you you have a closing date in the end of May. Yes, but I just got an update. Um, what was it? The big be the beginning the, the end of last week saying that they're having trouble clearing the title. So I I haven't gotten back to them to see, you know, what that is. Okay, I'm not really comfortable with with um, going um, uh, to the uh, to July. Um, what I propose is that um, we still go with the 30 days, but that would put it in uh, around June 19th. I'd be willing to go to um, the first week of July uh, in that you either have the property, uh, have a signed HUD sheet to the potential buyer, or you have a permit for uh, a permit application in our system um, by the beginning of July. Okay, so it's a signed HUD sheet. What would that? Yeah, so you usually what happens is if you if you transfer a property and somebody buys the property, it's a settlement sheet, and basically it's a signed HUD sheet. Uh, that tells the department who you who bought the property so that we can serve notice on to that new owner. So what I would ask you to do is take my email address down uh, and email me that signed HUD sheet by, um, let, me, let me see here, I'll give you the date. Um, I'd be looking for that signed HUD sheet by July 3rd. Um, if I don't receive that July by July 3rd, then yes, the city would um, but be able to do a uh, enforcement by way of demolition. Um, but that would be my my only, um, that would be my assessment to the board. Is that a permit or a signed HUD sheet has to be the part, has to be turned over to the department um, by July 3rd. Okay, and the permit is is from? The department. Okay. You would have to engage the services of an engineer and a contractor and oh, okay. then have to apply for a permit by July 3rd. Tom, would the uh, seller be notified of the violation? Is that something that automatically happens at closing? So, or? if she's selling it through a real estate agent, they are required to pull a uh, property cert. A private sale does not have to do that, but Miss Riley is under the obligation to tell them that the property is deemed as eminently dangerous, um, and and then they are to. That's why I'm asking for the signed HUD sheet so that I can serve notice on the new owner. Okay. Um, you, do I have your email address or would you be emailing me? No, email? you don't, but you will in a second. Oh, uh, so okay. my email address is thomas.rybikowski and I'm not, uh, I'll spell it. It's thomas, T H O M A S. Mm -hmm. Yes. Dot Rybikowski, R Y B A K O W S K I. Okay. Um, if she has issues with the title transfer, she should get in touch with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, if we don't have, like I said, if we don't have the signed HUD sheet by July 3rd, then yes, she would be looking at almost, she would be looking at a demolition occurring pretty quickly after that date. Um, finish it's your email. at phila, P H I L A dot gov, G O B. Okay. Okay, Miss Riley. Yes. Is that okay? Yes. Yes, that's okay. Okay. All right. Stay in touch with. Stay in touch with Tom if you have anything that you know is out of kilter. If they, if they can't get the house sold or whatever. Okay. Okay, I would let Mister um, Rob Kelsey know. Okay. Thank you very yes. much. Good luck. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Miss Riley. Right. Bye bye. Bye. Bill, do we have anyone for the next case in the waiting room? No, we do not. All right. Why don't we pause the recording? Especially. Thank you. Okay. Um, 5542 Pearl Street never showed up. So uh, it was an imminently danger, dangerous building. So what we're going to do is put things, some things on the record here. And uh, Tom, I also want to see pictures of the building. Got it. Okay.
Okay. So I'm going to ask us to proceed as normal and then just do what we do. Yep. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, this is the reporter. Is it necessary to swear Mr. Rybikowski in again? Uh, no, he's already he's, he's, he's already sworn, sworn in for he's already been sworn. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay. You want us to go through the, the process of like we should announce okay. the case. We should have the okay. good. All right. I, I'm Wayne Miller, board member. Yeah. Amy Rivera, board member. Ed Agus, board member. Ryan McSherry, board council. Oh, Philip Motto, Board's Administration. I'm Matthew Logic, I Supervisor. Thomas Robikowski, City of Philadelphia, License and Inspections. Okay. Uh, the appellant's not here. We're going through the case anyway. Um, Bill, could you read it into the record? Yes, this is case number three on today's list. MI 2023-002862 with a property located at 55. 42 Pearl Street. The appellant is Clarinda Farrington. There was no answer from Miss Farrington in the room. Okay. Uh, Tom, tell us about the case, please. Uh, so this is a uh, eminently dangerous case uh, or a declaration against the property at uh, 5542 Pearl Street uh, in the result of us being called out to, or the department being called out to the depart uh, the property uh, in response to a fire. Uh, again, the property was declared as eminently dangerous. In the appeal paperwork, uh, the reason for the appeal is it's very faint, um, but I will do my best. Um, I am in the process of selling the selling the property and if given more time uh, and it, it goes on that she wants to settle the estate of um, I, I would just uh, her mother's affairs and settled the estate um, in preparation for today's hearing. I did not see a new deed recorded uh, in this case. Uh, I'm going to propose to the board that this be uh, deemed as city affirmed for failure to appear uh, with the property being eminently dangerous. We would move ahead with uh placing the property out to bid for demolition. But prior to that, we would uh, go into the city records and make sure that the property wasn't sold to a new owner. If that we did discover that it was sold to a new owner or a property cert had been pulled, we would reach out to that uh, perspective, either real estate agent or perspective uh, new owner. With that said, I'll rest. But I will also share my screen and yes, show share the screen. If, if uh Imminently dangerous means that you would give them 10 days to make it safe. And um, if they don't take care of it in 10 days, you demolish the building. Am I right? Um, so you could go with that ruling if you wanted to, or you could just go with the denial with uh, failure to appear. I'll leave that into your, your hands. Um, but this is a photograph of the front of the property. Uh, when the property was posted uh, with the with the posting, and then so let me see here. All right, there we go. This is the back of the property. Uh, the viol the violation speaks that there is fire damage to the first and second floor and the main roof. This is the rear bay of the property. And you can see there's significant fire damage to the rear bay. And then I have one more photograph of the rear of the property. And that is next to the adjoining property, which is occupied. Okay. That's it. Is that, With that it, I, it, does it look like it can come down? What do you think? Um, uh, does it look like it's it's eminently dangerous? Yes. yes. Uh, so yes, it's a possibility that it would affect the adjoining properties. Okay. Tom, short of her appeal on March twenty fourth, have you heard from her at all? Uh no. A couple months on this. Uh, that's why I did check to make sure that there wasn't a new deed recorded. 
and okay. that it specifically names that she was looking to sell the property. I, I just don't, I, if it's inherently dangerous uh, and she didn't come to this meeting, she hasn't respond to a, responded to us in close to two months, uh, take it down. That's what I think now, if it's AIM or uh, Ed, whatever you think. I don't want a building falling down on our watch. No, but I'm tempted to give it another week for her to respond. I, I she's dealing with her, she's dealing with her mother's affairs. We don't know really what's happening. Um, and and the, if we didn't give it uh, the the actual amount of time she would have would be ten days if we just simply affirmed the denial or the city city affirmed as you were saying. So. Um, so if we, if we went, I mean, I could be there as, as soon as tomorrow to do the, to do the demolition. Um, it would be, it would be solely on, on what was, was ruled, uh, being that it's very failure to appear. Oh, so Wayne, you mentioned 10 days. Was that something that normally we give 10 days for them to get a permit to make safe on an imminently danger building, uh, and, if they don't do it in 10 days, we take it down. Is that normal process that we, we go through? Yeah. Can we give this a similar ruling to the other case where they have to either give you a HUD sheet to show that it was sold or they need to have a make safe permit and give them 10 days or something? Absolutely. Does that sound reasonable? Yeah, what's the, they what's were the imminently dangerous, are they? Yes, they were. Uh, the other they one were was eminently dangerous and we gave them 30 days, but uh, that turned into July 3rd. Right. Okay. But that one was more because there is a, a sale in process, but you know, a little more concrete. Right, we don't, we just don't know about this one. And also the person came to the board well, and, and, and told us of their intentions. Sure. Uh, two months, they did nothing. And then the, the boards, they now today, uh, they didn't show up. Yeah, 10 days oh. is the 29th, so what kind of a day of the week is that? I mean, I guess it'd be another, be like a Sunday, Monday. I think that's Sunday Memorial 19th. Day. That might be Memorial Day. Yeah, correct. Or the Sunday <clears throat> of Memorial Day weekend. Yeah, I mean, Amy, were you thinking like the Friday after Memorial Day or something? Or is that? Or the week after. June 3rd or something. <laughs> so if we don't hear anything from her from... Or I would say uh, a signed HUD sheet or a permit application by June fifth, and then we we would move ahead. Okay, sounds good. Okay, good deal. I just want to I want to have this on the record, uh, Mr. Motto. Uh, what what time? Uh, if you just provide the time that this matter was scheduled and attempts made to contact the appellant and whether or not service was made. Yes, sir. Um, Attempts were made to contact the appellant today at approximately 1.40. Uh, they, were, they were sent emails earlier in the week, I believe. Emails went out yesterday, including both a, a time and uh, a link to attend today's hearings. And there has been no response from the appellant to those attempts. And when you called today, did you leave a message or was that not an option? No, it, it went to directly to voicemail. The voicemail said, this is Clarissa Farrington. I left a message including both the office phone number, my email address, and I reminded them that the hearing was in fact ongoing today. Okay, very good. So I'm sorry, Tom, you said by June? June 5th. 5th? Okay. 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 Big easy time. With that, Thank enjoy you, your weekend. You too, pal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we can probably roll straight into the next hearing. I have four appellants in the room. If you like, I can bring them in just to ensure that they're all here for case number five. Sure. You do, Keith. Okay. I have a friend having you. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, I show four people just came in the room. Is everyone here for the property at 3415 Haverford? 
Yes. Yes. Okay, Mr. Miller, it appears everybody is going to be here for that case. 3415, have it for that. Okay. Okay. Start the recording. It's it's going. It's going. Okay. All right, let's get the case started. I'm Wayne Miller, board member. Amy Rivera, board member. Ted August, board member. Brian McSherry, board council. Philip Motto, board's administration. I'm Matthew Wojcik, LNI supervisor. Okay. Um, who, who put that up? Uh, I did. Sorry. Um, I'm Mark Wallace, um, uh, the architect. Okay. Just hold on. We got a procedure we go through. Okay. Uh, I apologize. No problem. It's okay. Uh, all right. Continue, Phil. This is case number five on today's list, MI 2023-002738 for the property located at 3415 Haverford Avenue. The appellant was Eric Madsen. Is Mr. Madsen here or someone replacing him? Uh, no, but he's just the expediter. Okay. okay. You have four people in here today? Yes, we do. Okay. We're, uh, is all four people going to be testifying? Mm -hmm. No, I don't believe so. The 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 main testifier is going to be Mark Wallace, who who inadvertently shared his screen a moment ago. Okay. All right. Now, uh, is anybody else going to be talking in this, or just him? I I I may talk, and Mr. Roman Sasowski, who's on video, may talk. Okay. So if you Are you a lawyer? Yes, I am. Okay. You don't have to be sworn in. The other two guys have to be sworn in. We're going to do it individually. Start with. Um, I'm all far from the, from the screen. Let me tell you. <laughs> okay. Mark, we're going to start with you and then we're going to go to Roman. Mark, please raise your right hand. Swear to, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Please respond. Yes. Okay. Next guy, Roman, please raise your right hand. Swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Please respond. Yes. Okay. Phil, you put it into the record. Okay. Whoever's going to take do the case, Mark, go ahead. Sure. Um, let me just share. Um, so what you're seeing before you is a seller and first floor plan for 3415 to 17 Haverford Avenue. Um, this is what was previously uh, presented to the Board of Building Standards and granted our variance. We essentially have a landlocked rear yard and we created a separate hour rated um, egress corridor from the rear yard through the building out to the front of the right of way. And then this was approved by the Board of Building Standards. Um, the changes that uh, we would like to make was we went to uh, the zoning board and removed the commercial unit to turn it into a residential unit in the front. That unit has no bearing on any of the variances granted from the Board of Building Standards. Um, it meets all code issues. Uh, the unit in the rear, um, after we were able to clear out the cellar, we found essentially a, uh, the rear portion of the building is half a story out of grade. So we created a new bedroom in the cellar in the rear um, because we had a clear eight foot span down or uh, nine foot um, span down there. So we figured we would use the space, create an egress well into the rear yard. Um, effectively, we added 350 square feet to the project, uh, which is an additional two and or essentially one and three quarters occupants so average it up to two additional people in the uh project and then um the rest of that is unchanged we're hoping to use the same um egress corridor that we created through the center of the building um to have a second means of egress for these people out of the their unit and Basically, when, when we discovered this, we were looking at it as what we thought would just be an amendment to the to the plan. And uh, Ellen and I disagreed and said it would have to be a whole new building permit. So that's why we need to come back for essentially what's the same variance. But, but Ellen and I would not let us amend the permit because of the residential change. Who did you speak with in Ellen and I? Uh, I who, forget who the plan's Mark, examiner was. Who was the examiner? Who was Shakir? Um, Shakir. Shakir Cohen. Shakir Cohen. Cohen. Shakir Cohen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Matt, you, do you know about this? Well, I'm just covering for Jace today that this is the first time I've looked at any of this. So okay. I had yeah. a we, brief we, time to look over it. Uh, I did find a comment that Shakir left 
right before I guess you went and applied for this new permit, where it just says sent a uh, email sent to uh, Eric Madsen on uh, December 16th. I don't have that email. And he didn't save it anywhere. So I don't know what that email said. I'm guessing it just said this is actually going to need a new permit, not an amendment. Right. That, that's my understanding of what, what the correspondence was. We we had asked uh, if if this could be considered as an amendment to the existing permit. And uh, he, he said no. So we, we filed a new okay. I don't have a problem with it, Wayne. Okay. I mean, they're, they're providing a means of egress out of a basement unit. Okay, and plus come back through the building. Time. Okay. Yeah. I think you have a problem. No, I, I would agree. I, I think it's doesn't. I think it's good. Okay. All right. Problem. I think it's good too. Okay, good luck, guys. Thank All right, everyone. Much. Thank good you good very good. much for your time. No problem. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for squeezing us in early. We appreciate okay. it. That was nice. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Enjoy the rest right. of your day. All right. Have a good okay. afternoon. Sweet. We can probably stop recording. Uh, I'm Wayne Miller, board member. Amy Rivera, board member. Ted Agus, board member. John Dimes, fire code. Brian McSherry, board council. Philip Motto, boards administration. I'm Matthew Wojcik, LNI supervisor. Okay. I'm going to swear everybody in individually and you'll respond to me. Okay. We'll start out with uh, Bill. We're starting out with you, Valerio. Okay. Okay. And if you're a lawyer, let me know. Who, anybody in here lawyers? Eileen Quigley from Ballard Spar on behalf of the applicant, Woodmere Art Museum. Okay. You, don't have to, you don't have to get sworn in. Okay. All right. Bill, raise your right hand. Swear to tell the truth, tell the truth, talk about the truth. I do. Fine. Good. Okay. Yep. Nicole, raise your right hand. Swear to tell the truth, tell the truth, talk about the truth. Respond. Oh, she's frozen. Yeah. Okay, we'll go to somebody else. Adam, Jacob, Adam, you're a lawyer? You look like a lawyer. Uh, thank you, I think. Okay. <laughs> Raise your right hand, swear to tell the truth, all truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Uh, respond. Okay. Uh, Matt, raise your right hand, swear to tell the truth, all truth, nothing but the truth. Respond. I do. Okay, Adam. Brogenowski? If Adam Trojanowski. Okay, yes. Adam, okay. Uh, raise your right hand, swear to tell the truth, tell the truth, don't cut the truth, respond. I do. Okay, and we'll get the call. You were frozen. Okay, you do, great. All right, that's fine for everybody. All right. So you have one more. So, so can you I gotta mute yourself. Can you mute yourself? So Me, I'll just sorry. Oh, I didn't say him. Okay, raise your right hand, swear to tell the truth, tell the truth, don't about the truth. Respond. Okay. All right, Phil, put it in the record. This case number four on today's list, MI 2023-002458 for the property at 9101 Germantown Avenue. Matthew Baird Architects is the appellant. Okay. Whoever's going to present the case, please do. Yes. Uh, first, I would just like to make a brief intro. So everybody was introduced on our team. Uh, my name is Eileen Quigley. I'm here on behalf of the applicant Woodmere Art Museum uh, from Ballard Spar, 1735 Market Street, uh, Philadelphia 19103. Uh, as you know, we're here uh, seeking variances from certain building code regulations with regard to 9101 uh, Germantown Avenue, which really relates to McGuire Hall, which is an historic, uh, historic building. Uh, we would like to... Uh, present and it will be presented by Adam Jacob uh, from Krieger Architects. But first, um, Bill Valerio will give a brief uh, rundown of the historic significance and what uh, Woodmere does as a museum uh, for life safety. I just want to let the board know that uh, we believe that the alternatives and mitigation that we're going to be presenting to the board today uh, meet or exceed uh, the code requirements. and. Failure to grant the relief would actually be a hardship on the applicant with regard to use of this building uh, and preservation and accessibility. Uh, so with that, I would ask, uh, oh, just um, also, the, we did submit materials and in those materials, we also include uh, letters of support 
from well-known and well-respected preservationists in the city, as well as plans and um, additional documentation. Uh, so with that, I would just ask um, Bill Valerio to take over. Thank, uh, you. thank you, Eileen, and thank you, members of the board. I'm Bill Valerio, the director of Woodmere Art Museum, and we are excited to be expanding and creating galleries for our collection of Philadelphia's artists in our new historic building, uh, which we call McGuire Hall. Um, as noted, a big part of Woodmere's interest in McGuire Hall is the historically significant interior, the architects, Copen Stewartson, and the woodworker in particular, Edward Main, were all lead figures in the art and culture of late 19th and early 20th century Philadelphia. The extensive wood carving by Maine is rare to be in complete and original condition, and it is a priority of the museum to preserve the artistry of uh, the main stair, uh, the space that is the former dining room, and other spaces in the building. Excuse I, me, Bill, can I interrupt you for one second? Yes. I uh, sincerely apologize. Um, Mr. Chair, may I share my screen with materials so they can go through it for the board? Sure, absolutely. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, Bill. Not at all. Thank you, Eileen. Um, uh, as, as part of the materials, I think Eileen is sharing. Um, we submitted letters of support uh, with regard to the importance of the historic um, interiors. These are from people like David Brownlee, who's you know, one of our city's great architectural historians um, and from other important organizations. Um, switching to life safety, um, I hope you may be able to consider um, that Woodmere is an accredited museum of the American Alliance of Museums. This is the AAM, which is the National Oversight Group for American Museums. Accordingly, we operate by high standards and quite stringent rules when it comes to life safety and protection of art. And all of this is formalized in a disaster preparedness and emergency response plan, which is reviewed by the AAM on an ongoing basis and was actually re-approved, re reviewed and re-approved this very year in 2023. The plan that I just described uh, makes clear to all staff that life safety um, is prioritized at the museum in emergencies before art is even considered. Uh, requirements of the plan include regular inspection, maintenance, and staff familiarity with smoke detectors, with pull boxes, extinguishers, alarm systems, sprinklers, Staff are trained in CPR and are assigned specific duties in response and evacuation. Woodmere prohibits open flame in heating of food or appliances, and such uh, protective measures are in place um, that prohibit candles. And of course, there's no smoking inside, but we prohibit smoking on the grounds as well. And I just want to thank you for the consideration of the significance of our interiors and, you know, a, a, you know, a, a consideration of the fact that as an accredited museum, life safety is something that um, we take very seriously um, above and beyond um, what, um, uh, above and beyond everything we could be required to do. So I want to thank you for that. Thank you, Bill. Uh, with that, I believe Adam Jacob from Krieger Architects. Adam, are you ready? Yes, I am. And I will go to A0003 for your presentation. Great, thank you. And good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you for your oh. time. Um, I'm Adam Jacob. I'm a senior associate at Krieger Architects with 25 years work experience following a Bachelor of Architecture degree from Drexel University. Uh, as a local architecture firm with our office in Philadelphia, we are assisting Woodmere and their lead architect, Matthew Baird Architects, in navigating the city of Philadelphia's zoning and building permitting processes and providing guidance on building code issues. 
Uh, Francis M. McGuire Hall, formerly known as St. Michael's Hall, is a significant contributor to the Chestnut Hill Historic District, which is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. You will hear a common thread throughout this presentation about the need to preserve the historic character defining features of this building while meeting the spirit and intent of life safety and accessibility, which forms the crux of our seven appeal requests. Our ap application for preliminary plan review identifies the existing building use classification as group R3, having formerly served as a convent. The proposed change of use includes art museum gallery spaces, public assembly, and exhibition spaces with a focus on welcoming the public for exhibitions and tours. These activities are typically classified as group A3, but the existing building code contains a special occupancy exception for museums in historic buildings that when approved by the code official would classify the building occupancy as group B per IEBC 1201.3. Specifically, this section reads, where a building in group R3 is used for group A, B, or M purposes, such as museum tours, exhibits, and other public assembly activities, or for museums less than 3,000 square feet, the code official may determine that the occupancy is group B, where life safety conditions can be demonstrated in accordance with section 1201.2. 1201.2 requires a written report to identify each required life safety feature in compliance with the existing building code for historic buildings. Where compliance with other chapters would be damaging to the contributing historic features, it must be demonstrated how the intent of these provisions is complied with in providing an equivalent level of safety. Classification of this building as group B is central to refusal topic one, which has a ripple effect on other refusal topics if relief is not granted. We had several thoughtful conversations with the plan examiner, Shakir Cohen, regarding this topic, and he shared that given the specific nature of this particular code section, there is little existing precedent to render a decision. The plan examiner related this section to the Betsy Ross House, which is a small residence where the building is the museum. The ICC has a broader interpretation of this code section and rendered an opinion that aligns with our interpretation of IEBC 1201.3, that the proposed activities and historic status of the building meet the criteria for a group B occupancy classification. The existing building is four stories, non-sprinklered, and classified as type 3B construction. The building is not currently accessible as there are multiple level changes on each floor and no accessible building entrances. The architectural plan for the renovation of McGuire Hall calls for rigorous life safety improvements, including full accessibility of every space in the building by introducing ramps, chair lifts, and an elevator to link all floors and intermediate level changes with new accessible building entrances connecting the accessible route to a public way. New code compliant handrails and enhanced one hour fire resistance rating for the existing three story secondary egress stair. Replacement of existing fire escape with new code compliant fire escape and a new wet sprinkler system throughout McGuire Hall where no system existed previously. Regarding public safety, Woodmere is an accredited museum of the American Alliance of Museums. As such, it follows emergency, fire safety, and security protocols that meet or exceed life safety code regulations. A written report was submitted along with the preliminary plan review to satisfy the requirements of IEBC section 1201.2. This report echoes the improvements mentioned in our talking points and demonstrates how life safety conditions are provided that support an occupancy classification of Group B. Eileen, could you please pull up Exhibit 1? Oh, yep, you got it. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> refusal Topic 2 relates to the size of the elevator car to accommodate an ambulance stretcher. 
Actually, mm -hmm. Adam, could I interrupt you just for one second? Just oh, a little sure. Bit of background on this. I mean, I, I've gone to the museum, you know, a number of times over the years. Um, do you or, or perhaps Bill know when, how long has this been a museum? I, you, you refer to a change of use, but is that just a question of legalizing a longstanding, you know, use that is uh, only occasioned by the renovations that you're doing at this point? Uh, no. So Woodmere acquired this property, which is a near adjacent property. This was a convent up until 2021, a convent for the Sisters of St. Joseph's. And we acquired it in order to transform the building into museum galleries. Previously, it was a residence um, for the Sisters of St. Joseph. Um, they're dwindling in numbers and made the decision. So this this is independent of, of the existing museum. Oh, that, this is not Woodmere's main building. I'm I got sorry. you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. This is not Woodmere's main building, but it is from it is it originates in 1855 at the same time. So it looks like that building. Well, <laughs> superficially. Sorry. Superficially. Thank Great. Thank you. Uh, right. Any other questions before I continue on to exhibit two? Does anybody have questions on at a refusal of one? Uh, can I have a question? Is, sure. Is that okay? Yeah. Sure. Oh, okay. Just checking. Uh, for the elevator, uh, I know the refusal is for not being big enough for a stretcher, which is in the IBC and doesn't relate to accessibility. It's like in addition to that. Uh, is it also too small for it to be? Is it also too small to be accessible? So, so I'm going to. This is actually refusal topic two, um, so, so I will yeah. I will delve into that. Oh, no, that's okay. okay. Um, but but to answer your question ahead of time, yes, it, it is an accessible elevator. It just okay. doesn't accommodate the stretcher. Right. Okay, just checking. Yep. All right. All right, board. Do we want to take these items one by one and decide now so. if we want to consider it a class B? All right, I'm sorry, um, a business occupancy. Um, Matthew, per the code, do you think it meets it? You're asking me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Just checking. Uh, I'm not that familiar with this section. Let me just open up code real quick again. It's 1201.3. 1201.3, correct. Got it, got it, got it. I also didn't, uh, I'm also filling in for Jay, so I didn't review this refusal before today. I'm just okay. filling in. That's yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know we're over 3,000 square feet, so that's. Yeah, uh, so, we don't so need this it used to be a convent, so that'd be R3, and then it was used for A, B, or M, uh, or for museums less than 3,000 square feet. Okay, so the way it's phrased is a little weird. It's used for group A, B, or M, purposes, such as museum tours, exhibits, and other public uh, assembly activities. Excuse or me, for... uh, Mr. Wojcik, pardon me, this yeah. is the court reporter. Could you, like, slow down just a little bit? Sorry. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I was just skimming through it but yeah i'll i'll talk slower uh the code official may determine that the group that the occupancy is group b where life safety conditions can be demonstrated in accordance with section 12 1.2 so that's the report that you submitted uh adequate means of egress uh maybe included retaining doors and open in, a, in an open position uh limit on building occupancy to an occupant load uh, or supervision by person knowledgeable. Okay, so it's mostly referring back to the report, and it's on the report to show that it can be a group B. Okay, so maybe we'll hold on this one. And... So I think you just have to read the report <laughs> first, the the board members, that is. I think yeah. it's kind of a discretionary thing. It's not a, like an objective, a, a like, you know, black or white thing. You okay. kind of to read it and see what the uh, design professional has said to justify it being classified as group B rather than, uh, I guess, A in this case. Okay. All right. we'll All right, you, can go, you can go on to right. item two, Adam. Uh, okay, great, thank you. Okay, okay moving on to refusal topic two. Um, uh, Eileen, if you could pull up exhibit one again, please. Great, thank you. Um, so refusal topic two relates to the size of the elevator car to accommodate an ambulance stretcher. A new accessible elevator is being proposed where none currently exists. Multiple locations were studied to determine the optimal placement for a new elevator, 
and the proposed location is the only one that can provide an accessible route to all main and partial floor levels. This location is physically constrained by a projecting roof line at the top floor level and adjacent masonry window bay on lower levels that limit the elevator size. The proposed elevator cab clear dimensions are 51 and a half inches by 69 inches, which are the maximum dimensions possible to retain the bay window, one of the character defining features of the building. While it is accept acceptable practice to fit the stretcher on the diagonal, this cab dimension does not accommodate the required code dimensions. Um, again, would you like to take each one individually or should we uh, carry through? Okay. Uh, does any anybody have an issue with the elevator? John, would you have an issue with that? Getting people out if, if it's not big enough on stretchers? Uh, it, it depends on what condition the patient's in. I mean, if you can sit them up a little, right? I mean, and the, the actual, there's a bar on the back of the stretcher that actually flips down. You sit the person up a little bit. You usually can get them in on a diagonal. Uh, if if you can't, you, you put them in a reef and you carry them down the, carry them down the steps. I mean, I've been in situation where, I mean, obviously we rather have a, uh, to, to code sized elevator buildings like this are limited in, in the shafts and stuff like that. So I guess the answer to my question is, yeah, sometimes you're going to have to lay people flat. And you're going to be doing CPR on them as you're taking them down the elevator, if that's the condition. If somebody fell and they, you know, they've sprained their knee. So it depends on, the, again, what the medical condition is. So that would be up to you guys. But there are a variety of uh, scenarios where you would want that elevator large enough to be able to lay that stretcher flat, to be able to do what you have to do while you're on the way out of the building so okay yeah i think we recognize the constraints of the of the building and you know I, we, we can talk about it you know, yeah. side, but, uh, I'm, okay. I'm just curious the plan showed that the elevator has is 67 square feet whereas the inside cab dimensions you just described are only 24 square feet is, how do you make up that difference i mean a, a foot either side on the of the cab, it still doesn't come up to 67 based on the cab dimension you, you noted. Yeah, N Nicole, would you be willing to respond to that? Um, sure. Yeah, the elevator shaft itself has structure that's required. So those are clearances that we need to avoid when sizing the cab. And then the cab itself has exterior dimensions. So we have worked with an elevator company to size the largest car that we can fit in the given shaft area. And we've worked with our structural engineer to minimize the size of the structure to um, keep those shaft walls to the minimum. Um, so the combination of those thicknesses um, leaves us with the car dimension that Adam previously shared. It just seems off that with a 24 square foot cap dimension, but in plan you're saying it's a 67 square foot enclosure. I don't know. It doesn't make sense. Eileen, would you be willing to pull up a floor plan again, please? Right. If you can zoom in on the elevator. Trying to increase the size in this. Are you on A3, Adam? Uh, yes, A A3 A three would be fine. Yeah. Uh, I have a another. I have another copy. If you'd rather, I could share my screen. Sure. If you um, have, yes, yeah, I'll well. stop sharing mine for a minute. Okay, great. Okay.
Okay, did, th did this come up on your end here? Yes. 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 Okay, great. So this is, this is the elevator in question. Um, and we can go to the second floor, which is, um, oh, it's thinking. All right. Yeah, just to point out in this case, the glass walls have additional structure inboard of the glass wall. It's a curtain wall with a steel structure support behind. So there's some additional thickness um, behind the glass. And I believe the 61 square feet is measuring to the interior face of the glass that may be accounting for some of the additional square footage. Okay. Here, this illustrates, yeah, this illustrates the condition at the bay. Yeah, that's okay. That's on the other floors. Yeah, that wasn't showing up, but that that's clear. But again, it doesn't make sense to me that, that with the cap dimensions you noted, I, I calculate it comes up to 24 point something square feet. Even if you add a foot on every side, <clears throat> It still doesn't come up to 67. Amy, I think it's just the program nomenclature thing on the square the square footage that's that is pro right. um, It's just we gotta trust them that they can't get seven feet, you know, the 84 inch depth there. Yeah. And it's because of the uh, bay window. If it would be helpful, we can share as an appendix a more detailed drawing from the elevator manufacturer, which shows the you know precise car within the shaft, if that would be a helpful addition. No, but um, Adam, can you just tell me the inner dimensions again? It was 41 point something inches or something like that? Uh, yes, the dimensions that we have, uh, sorry, bear with me, uh, 50, 51 and a half by 69 inches. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna stop my share again. And I'll turn I'll turn the sharing back over to Eileen for the exhibits. Yep. Um, and when when you're ready, uh, we can move on to the next refusal topic. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions on the elevator? No. Nope. Okay. Let's move on. Okay. Refusal topic three. Great. Thank you, Eileen. Could you please pull up exhibit two? Okay, refusal topic three does not allow the existing main stair to remain open as it connects three stories when the occupancy classification changes to group A3. The basement is accessed by a separate and enclosed stair stacked beneath the main stair. As a group B occupancy, the existing stair is per, uh, permitted to remain unenclosed per IEBC section 802.2.1, since the building is sprinklered throughout. Should our appeal for Group B occupancy classification be denied, Group A3 requires enclosure of the stair or integration of this volume in the design of the smoke control system as an atrium space per IBC 404.6. Our MEP engineers have determined that the design of the smoke control system would require large mechanical ventilation and equipment external to the building and large makeup air intake grills on the interior of the stair hall, which would disrupt the historic character defining features of the building. Equally detrimental is enclosure of the main stair with rated partitions or a glass enclosure with fire sprinkler system as this would be destructive to the ornate millwork found throughout the entry hall and main stair. I'll open up the floor again to, to questions. So if it's a business occupancy, that it won't matter, correct? 
Correct. This this one does go right back to refusal topic one. Okay. So this goes away if if one is granted. And is the vertical opening um, extending you know, two floors, three floors? What's the? Um, Eileen, could you share your uh, the floor plans again? Uh, in essence, it it extends three floors. So the main floor level and the upper two floors are all connected with an open stair. The basement or lowest level is served by a separate stair that stacks beneath this one. Um, and what's the extent of the proposed sprinkler system? Is it throughout the building or? It is throughout the building, yes. Yeah. Yeah, 13 throughout. Yeah, we, we, we do have a, an expert uh, from Altieri, uh, if you would like to hear more about the sprinklers uh, or the smoke control system. Well, just, I mean, in terms of smoke control, is there anything in terms of uh, existing or proposed, you know, uh, fascias around the stair enclosure, anything that would kind of reduce the uh, migration of smoke into the, uh, into the vertical opening? Uh, none exists today. Currently, um, as a B occupancy, none would be required uh, because it wouldn't be an atrium space. But as an as an atrium space uh, is when that would kick in. Okay. So real quick, this is Lieutenant Dimes fire code. This is this is a museum, correct? Correct. How many? What's the occupancy of the museum, and what do you? How many people do you expect to be in there at any one time? So. We, we can relay that per floor. Um, so what's what's on the drawings, the, the calculated occupant loads are in the basement level, 66. On the first floor interior spaces, the, there's, um, the drawings also include the, the, the deck or the outdoor spaces, but the interior only is 173. The second floor is 75, and the third floor is 29. Okay, thank you. Three forty-three. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, the the com the so that total is three forty-three. Any other questions on refusal item three? Okay, let's go on to refusal item four. Okay, um, Eileen, could you please pull up Exhibit three? I'm sorry, did I get too far? Oh, uh, no, that's, yep, there we go. So refusal topic four requires a one hour fire resistance rated door with opening protectives to access the three story secondary egress stair from the existing dining room. And, and in exhibit three, what we're looking at on that bottom picture is the door and it's built into that elaborate woodwork uh, along the wall of the dining room. Uh, Woodmere is committed to the historic preservation of these spaces and modification to this door would be detrimental to preserving this character defining feature. One hour fire resistance rated construction is not required to be provided to existing walls and ceilings per IEBC 1203.7 where the existing wall and ceiling finish is wood or metal lath and, uh, and plaster. As an opening into the three-story enclosed stair with walls constructed of wood and metal lath and plaster, we submit that a sufficient level of safety is provided and is similar in intent to IEBC 1203.6, which allows tight-fitting doors without fire resistance rating in buildings of three stories or less. Of note is that this secondary back stair and the wing of the building that this stair serves is only three stories. Uh, I'll open the floor again to questions. Just a quick question. Uh, the uh, Is there a closer on the door, an automatic closer? Uh, none, none exists today. Okay. Is uh, the door usually closed? Yes. Okay. But it, it's used to access the stair, so it, I mean, it could be left open if it didn't have an automatic closer. Uh, what's the thickness? I mean, you know, we we definitely 
would not be looking to you to uh, replace this door, but I'm just curious uh, what's sort of the minimum thickness of the wood. Um, Nicole, would you have a, a, a guess on that? Just a guess. Um, I'm not aware of the minimum thickness of the wood. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't know offhand. I would say that if we did need to add a closer, I think that might be uh, feasible. Do you have a picture of the other side of this door so we can see how it... We we don't have... A, I don't think we have a photograph in, in these exhibits that show the back side of that door. Uh, but it is it is elaborate. It is the same elaborately carved door on both sides, um, and it, that door has to be at least two and a half inches thick. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? But it's a heavy door. I mean, it's yeah. no, but, uh, looking at it, it looks like a heavy door. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That is okay. Good. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's move okay. on. Okay, um, Eileen, could you please pull up Exhibit One? Refusal topic five pertains to accessing the fire escape on the fourth level through a non-compliant opening. There is an existing fire escape that is unsafe and in the same vicinity as the proposed elevator. A new fire escape is proposed in the same relative location and access on the fourth level is through the same existing dormer as the current fire escape. Uh, Eileen, could you just toggle down to it? Yeah, there we go, thanks. Um, so it's access is through the same existing dormer as the current fire escape, which includes a window opening. Modification of the dormer roof lines to accommodate a code compliant door height would be detrimental to the historic character of the building, as this would require removal of the dormer and modification of the roof line. We are proposing to replace the window with a custom arch top door that conforms to the current arch top window head height. This door will provide access to the fire escape to the fullest extent possible. Furthermore, we propose to limit occupancy on the fourth level to a maximum of 30 occupants to further improve life safety conditions where a calculated occupant load based on an assembly use area would yield an occupant load in excess of 50 persons. Um, I'll open the floor to questions again. How high is the sill of that window? Uh, it's relatively low to the floor. Um, I would say it's, uh, well, I, I'm gonna guess, I, I don't know exactly, but it's, it's lower than 18 inches to the floor. And I believe we are proposing to extend the window down to floor level. So in our proposal, we are modifying it to a door that will um, not be elevated above the floor. Yeah, right. okay. sounds good to me. I mean, Who shape is that uh, fire escape? And is it inspected all the time too? Well, they're taking that one out. They're providing a new one. They're going to put a new one in? Okay. Correct. And if you cross in front of any windows, you know, the thing is, we'd like to have a, uh, on that, if we approve it, we would like to have a, uh, a sprinkler head over the center line of the windows on the inside. So yeah. they don't blow yeah. out. And, you know, when the guys are going down the, uh, the uh, you, fire escape. Yeah, Wayne, if you look at the uh, the photos there, you get a sense of of where it is. Yeah, it hits one window. It's uh, maybe two windows. Yeah. All right. But keep that in mind. All right. Okay. Go ahead. All right, moving on to topic six. Uh, we'll stay on exhibit one for this. This is also a fire escape topic um, where code requires exterior stairways in lieu of newly constructed fire escapes when site constraints are not a limiting factor. As mentioned previously, the existing fire escape must be replaced for structural safety and to accommodate an accessible elevator. The replacement fire escape would be more code compliant than the existing one by meeting tread and riser requirements of the current code. Replacing the existing fire escape with an exterior fire stair would compromise the character defining features of the building. Uh, I'll, I'll open it, the floor again to questions. Anyone? Yeah, I mean, I, I have a question. Yeah, I don't, it's not really a question, but I, I, I assume that it's going to appear very similar to what exists. I mean, uh, it's just that 
extending sort of further past that day because of the tread and riser ratios or um, where is it going to look? Yeah, Nicole, would you be willing to speak to that? Yeah, there will actually be some modifications on that bay window we are planning to remove. Um, and the fire escape will pass in front of a flat wall at that location. The elevator will actually come up right where the large window is. So you can see from the third floor, you come down to a landing on the right. second floor. That will actually be the location of the new elevator. So the path of the fire escape will be somewhat uh, modified, but it will be coming out from the same third floor window and passing back. Um, there'll be additional um, switchbacks in order to account for the rise and run that is required. Um, Eileen, would it be helpful to pull up a floor plan of that? Which one, Adam? The... Uh, let's go to the second floor plan. Yeah. I mean, in, in what way is it, uh, I guess, Matt, I'm trying to get the distinction between an exterior fire stair and a fire escape. Right. The fire, the rise and run for a stair are more stringent than the rise and run for the fire escape. So we will be compliant with the rise and run for a fire escape, but not for a fire stair. And they're both at 36 inch width? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that we have a description in one of the notes um, about the requirements, maybe on the third floor. Uh, I do have width of fire escapes from the IEBC. Uh, stairway shall be not less than 22 inches wide. Yeah. And And what do we have here? It is 22 inches, so it is compliant with the IEBC fire escape requirements. Yeah, if anything, I, I mean, well. That's narrow. Sorry? That's very narrow. It is narrow, yeah. I mean, it, you're obviously attempting to kind of tuck it in alongside the kind of behind the where the elevator protrudes. Um, I mean, if it were wider, but still meeting the rise and run of the uh, that's allowed with a fire escape, would you be comfortable? I think that may be feasible. Yes, it, we could we could widen it. And the rise and run are more the limiting factor that would cause it to project and interfere with the existing porch. Um, but the width of it, um, we I believe we could accommodate a wider width. Yeah, and, and Matt, I assume that you would rather, or I mean, typically you guys would want to see a continuous width for the top to bottom rather than being narrower and then widening. Yeah, we yeah, I'm pretty sure that's a code requirement for like just regular exit stairs. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? Next. Sure. Okay. All right. Uh, Go to the next one. Okay. Last topic. Um no no slides required. Um refusal topic seven was issued in response to a common path of egress travel shown on the preliminary plan submission for the basement level that exceeded the 75 foot code maximum. The plan will be adjusted to provide code compliant common path of egress travel distance not in excess of 75. So the appellant does not wish to pursue a building code variance at this time for review, refusal topic seven. Um, that goes away. <laughs> yep, that, that one goes away. Uh, so. Uh, in conclusion, uh, we're, we're believe, we believe that we're balancing preservation of the historic character of the building while at the same time providing an equivalent level of life safety for each of these refusal topics. And we hope that the board will grant Woodmere these variances. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Question, you had mentioned that it was on the National Historic Register. Is it on the Philadelphia Historic Register as well? It is not on the local Philadelphia register. It is only on the national register as a contributor to the Chestnut Hill Historic District. 
It's not individually registered. Okay. Uh, Phil, you want to put us in the caucus? In the you breakout have to do it yourself. Room? You do it yourself, Wayne. Oh, okay. Room, All room right. set up. You should be fine to go in there. Um, we have to start recording. All right. Give me a second here. All right. Okay, is everybody here? Are we on the record? Um, yes, sir. Okay, let's go. All right, number one, we want to leave it as an A. We believe it's an assembly. And we'll go item for item what we what we're going to do. Um, number two, the elevator uh, car to accommodate the stretcher. We're okay with that. Do whatever you can to get something in there. Like if it could fold it up, the, uh, a stretcher that can can work. Uh, so I guess that'd be about the best you can do with that. Uh, we, we feel with a five foot nine width, you can get a stretcher in there in an upright position. To, to get somebody out. The width's five foot nine, right? One of the dimensions is five nine. And that's a, one question is whether, you know, Woodmere would be providing a stretcher or whether that's something you depend on whoever, you know, is there in a rescue capacity. Um, so I guess we would just say, if you're providing it, shop around for something that works as well as possible with the, uh, you know, uh, with hey. the elevator. Hey, Dimes, what, the, what would the fire department do? Bring their own stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah. We have all of our own stuff. It, I, I don't, I've never been to a EMS response where the building was was providing uh, a okay. structure. Yeah. yeah. Good enough. I right, tell the fire department, Dimes, to bring something in. <laughs> yeah, we, have, we have things. We have stair chairs. We have, okay. Uh, think back. I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. Can, yeah. Okay, good. Um, all right, then uh, number three. In the, it's the open stairway. Uh, is there anything possible that we could put something like a smoke curtain to stop the the flow of smoke going up? John, you, guess... are you familiar with anything like in these big stairs like that? Uh, that was directed to me, Wayne. Yeah, John. I mean, yeah, there. I mean, they have to talk to a fire protection engineer and see what the latest stuff. Yeah, there there's smoke curtains. There's things you can do with you know, but you know. It, it's it's one of those things. I I concur with it's more of an assembly uh, than a, a business occupancy. Looking at the definition, so you have you know I I concur with going that way. And again, smoke is the thing that gets to most people. So compartmentalizing and keeping the smoke in certain areas is better than not. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not a fire department or a fire uh, engineer, but there, there's products out there. They would have to find that out. But I, there's nothing I could really recommend. Well, th I mean, things we've seen before, and I, obviously with the historic nature of it, we don't want it, anything to be as any more intrusive than necessary. I mean, uh, you know, a glass fascia basically dropping down 18 inches minimum, um, you know, kind of going around the opening, again, limiting the migration of smoke. So we could certainly provide a smoke baffle. Yes. Okay. All right, fine. That could be done. That would be good. Okay. Um, let me see. Um, all right. The next one. Um, let me see number four. Or, or... The door. Door. The yeah, door. the door. Uh, we're we're okay with the door. Uh, is that door tight? That like oh. no smoke can go under or or through the side. Is that a tight door in there? Fit. It's a tight fitting door now. Yes. And so. You don't it think any be... smoke would get around, get through there if it was if it was a, a fire? I think we'd need to add seals, but Nicole, would do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I was going to say if we needed to add seals on the interior stairway side of the door, um, I think we could accommodate that. Yeah, we, we, and we do want a closer on it. Um, yes, and a, and a closure, yeah. All right. Okay. The next one is... Um, Is the fire escape details? Is that what it is? The access uh, to the fire escape. Yes. Fire um, access. Okay. Uh, we're okay with that. Uh, well, we want to know how how tall will that door be? I mean, we all you've shown us is 
a very distant picture of a window that you're going to make a little bit lower. But in the end, how tall, tall will that be? It would be five foot eight to the top of the arch. Okay. Yeah, and down to the th threshold. Brian, you would have the duck going through there. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. The next one, the fire escape. Uh, what what did what did you say? How wide you could make that? I believe we could. We'll have to double check, but I believe that we could get up to three feet width if that were required. Okay, we would be fine with that. Yeah, and and we're yeah with providing three feet, but um, with a rise and run, uh, that's you know as if it were a fire escape would be acceptable. Okay, okay, and then if you could just resubmit the plans for uh, from the one hundred four to the seventy five. Uh, we will refine that to the plan examiner, and that'll be it. Okay. Um, Questions? So, yeah, it's uh, Jeff Krieger sure. with Krieger Architects. Is it okay uh, if we ask a follow-up question? Yeah, sure. Anything you want. Yeah. Thanks. So, um, under the first refusal one, which is about assembly versus business, does does and your ruling that it is indeed assembly use so does that what does that mean in terms of the open stair from the first to the third floor if we install glass fascia or smoke baffles is does that mean that we are not required to partition each floor yes would, yes so so if we provide some method of smoke control or smoke baffles, not a full smoke control system, you all are saying it's okay to leave the stair open from the first to the second to the third floor without fire rated partitions. Am I stating that correctly? Well, we are making that recommendation to our count, our commissioner. Yes, so put that, yes. That was just a recommendation. Okay. It's semantics, but it, we're not saying it's okay. We're saying we're uh, willing to recommend the variance uh, yes. with, you know, to... Right. It's excuse me i'm sorry excuse me this is the court reporter i don't believe this gentleman has been sworn in or i don't have his correct name uh, yeah uh, it's jeff krieger k-r-i-e-g-e-r -E um and i was i believe yeah, i was we swore jeff in yeah yeah, yeah. yeah put two hands up thank you <laughs> yeah so yeah I, again with the you know the the first item what we are not prepared to accept an interpretation one way or the other in terms of the uh, uh, whether it's an A or a B. Um, but so we're looking at each item on its own merit. Okay. okay. Any other questions? May I just ask a procedural question? I, I know following this, you'll have your letter of recommendation to um, the LNI code official. Is this something that? we can then address in follow-up revised plans back to l &I, provided at the, uh, the code official approves all the recommendations, then we would just revise the plans in, in accordance with the variances that were granted pursuant to today's hearing. Yes, I, I would think so, yeah. Uh -huh. Matthew, Matthew can answer that. What was that question Matthew? again? What was that question again? So Eileen. Matt, what we'll do is, it's Eileen Quigley. It, so we'll just follow up. Once the board sends its recommendations to LNI, LNI approves the recommendations, then we would just submit revised plans in accordance with each of the variances that were granted today. Uh, or yeah, modifications. Well, we, again, we didn't grant any variances. We're, no, but, no, yes. it'll be yeah, once LNI approves uh, whatever it, the recommendations are, our plans will be revised to reflect what happened or, or what L and I approves overall. Yes, and the, your, the letter, the only thing is it's uh, on occasion, the commissioner in writing a letter may add language or may right. modify something. So that's they, right. They may deny whatever you're recommending outright. It, it can be anything, but I, I just want to make sure that what we do once we get the final decision from L and I is that we'll just submit revised plans in accordance yeah. with whatever the final decision is. 
Absolutely. Why? Why? Why right. would? When they want to accept that, yeah, that's fine. Right. That's fine. Okay. I just do. I just want to make sure you don't want us to come back and say, "Hey, this is what we're doing. You're fine. You make the recommendation. L and I makes a decision. That decision gets reflected in revised plans that we send back to L and I." Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, can I ask one yeah. more follow up? Sorry. Can I ask one Go more follow up? Um, so, question as as an assembly use uh, throughout the building. Uh, is are there and this is type three B construction. So the the floors are wood framed. Uh, there's no fire resistance rating in those floor assemblies as they stand today. The only thing that is rated is a two hour envelope as a masonry building. Uh, if if the building is assembly throughout, uh, and the is there any limitations on or requirements that you would prescribe for uh, fire rating the floor assemblies on uh, on like the upper floors, for instance, or or are we are we okay as as is as the building stands today? Does that did did that answer or does that make sense? Are you implying that if it was a business use, you wouldn't need a, a rating on the floors, but as an assembly use, you think you need a rating on the floors? I think as, as a four-story building, if if we're if we're classified as a four-story building, I think the upper floor, as an assembly use, may require a separation. But there wasn't a there wasn't a refusal on that. Right. Right. No, that's right. There was no. Right. Refusal. So they were right. They're refusing it exactly. It, there wasn't refusal on that. So. Okay. Presumably, it wouldn't be an issue because right. Ellen and I was looking at it as an assembly. As an assembly, sure. Correct. Right. Okay, good. All right. Thank you. Everybody, good? All your questions answered or any questions? Any other questions? Uh, about that high and airy issue? Yeah, go I ahead. Just, man. To, just to chime in there, since it's not part of the refusal, I, I guess I can talk about it. Uh, as far as what the IBC says, uh, Group A3 sprinkler type 3B goes up to three stories. Type 3A goes up to four when it's fully sprinklered. So uh, that would be... So the main difference, I think, in this case between types uh, 3A and 3B is that, is that for 3A, uh, every floor needs to be fire rated. That's the only difference here. So, and that's based off of uh, uh, the IBC... Uh, section for heights and areas just for change of occupancy not part of the historic one specifically because i think that one only talks about uh area not necessarily height yeah for okay, building for area day. yeah yeah so for building area the uh the uh, historic buildings chapter chapter 12 it only has a provision about being able to exceed the maximum area by like 20% from what chapter five says, but it doesn't mention anything about height. So you would still be subject to that because it's a change of occupancy from R3 to A3 now. I have to ask. Um, yes. A, 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 a simpler explanation of that. I, I don't understand what we're talking about even. My understanding is that we will need to separate the third floor from the rest of the building because it's type 3B occupancy. Uh, fourth. Sorry, the fourth floor. Yes. Yes. Uh, let's see here. Chapter. Let me just look up what. If we don't exactly. consider it a fourth floor, or do we have to consider it a fourth floor? I mean, the, the lowest level is separate from the upper three by a permanently closed door. It would be considered a fourth floor, I believe. Yes. The lower level is not a basement. Oh. oh. It, we're, we're very oh. close. It's, uh, yeah, it, it depends on <laughs> where you measure from the building. But yeah, por portions are, below, you know, enough below grade that it would be a basement, but the average qualifies the building as a four story building. Yeah, and that's it's the thing. separated from the first floor. Do you know if there's a rated horizontal separation? There's not a rated separation currently. So I guess what we would propose is adding a rating to the separation between the third and fourth floors. And can you do that everywhere except where the stair basically, you know, penetrates the 
creates an opening between the third and fourth. In the, in the floor, the floor between the third and fourth, we could add a rating to it if required. Right, so but we can. You have a I'm building sorry. section. Sorry, we... I, I'm sorry, I don't <laughs> understand. Um... Could, could we look at a building section? I mean, I'm, between the, <laughs> yes. we're talking about this as third floor, you know, uh, where the top of the fire escape is the third floor. I mean, or is I mean, I'm looking at the third floor plan and it, it looks like maybe with another door. Yeah. I'll let the architect share it. Okay. I think we need a building section to uh, look at the elevation. Nicole, yeah, we don't have that. I think that's what we need. Because there's, there's a site okay. plan with the uh, average elevations, but there's no section view with the plan submitted. And we yeah. wouldn't need that to make that final determination if it's three or four stories. So we would we would make that as part of the submission of revised doc, uh, plans and documents, Matt? Yeah, yeah, it could be. Since it's not part of this whole prelim, you could just submit it with uh, everything else for the building permit. But just, I mean, to clarify for us, because it may help us. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, then, if you can share a, se a building section, something. <laughs> yes. Adam, do you have a building section you can share with the board right now? I, I can pull it up. I'm I'm just, sorry, searching for, for it right now, but it'll Thank just be one right. Yeah. So while well, Nicole is searching for the building section, right? So the issue, um, if it's determined that it's a four-story building, then we can uh, create a partition separating the topmost level from the stair, but, but we can't separate the, the stair itself getting to the topmost level because the, there's an, the stair has an intermediate landing. I believe we could separate the stair with a door if required. Uh, I, I don't see how- Nicole, are you pulling up that uh, elevation? Uh, yes, I am. I'm sorry, just one moment. So I, like what are, those are classic. Uh, I'm going to share screen in the meantime. All right. Um, this is the the top floor. Okay. I, I mean, this and whole this room area. could be the stair tower, I, and I think if the door was put here, that would enclose it at that top level. Gotcha. Where would it be put? In? Right here. Yeah. Okay. 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 And this is the floor that's posted at 29 occupants. 29 people. That's correct. And this is where the skinny or the, the little window out to the fire escape. It, right yeah, there. exactly. It's five foot eight high. Right. Okay. That's right. That's the little door. Yep. Uh, All right. I'll stop share for Nicole. Okay. Nicole can come in. Yeah. So, yeah. So that is, in fact, what you're, you've been calling the third floor, but you're now calling the fourth floor. <laughs> so we're, yeah, everyone that's familiar with this building knows it as the third floor because the, right. the west level is thought of as a basement. <laughs> like I, Nicole is no longer with us. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm I, it, sorry, and this is not to be critical, but a little bit. I mean, <laughs> you guys have been talking about collectively pieces of this inconsistently. So it's really important to graphically... Right photographs, drawings, all of that be clear. <laughs> yeah. That, you know, we really would like to be home by now, but well, I... <laughs> we also need a section view. <laughs> we, we are very grateful for your working with us. And right. yeah, um, I mean, as a non-expert, it is really hard for me to follow along with this conversation, I have to say. So my apologies. <laughs> no, 
at the end of the day, we want the building yeah. to be safe, you know, for that's all. Good work. Uh, and no, yeah. I know, and, and and we do too. I mean, it, you know, that's, we we share that. Um, we'll get it done. Uh, I was trying to get the call at. Uh, I'm looking to see if I can pull something up here. Yeah, anything like a section view. So I know yeah. the set submitted for the prelim was kind of like a truncated set of just floor plans. Well, and one site plan. They're saying it's a four story. So, but just the... yeah, that that was um, that was the code the code officials' determination uh, that that this needed to be uh, a four story. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. That was also okay. Oh, so that was also Shaq. I can try and just okay. message here real quick. Oh, great. Here's a... section views. But were you guys suggesting that you could separate horizontally and have a rated separation between the second and third floor? Um, between the third and fourth. I heard the call. Well, I, again, <laughs> between, oh, okay. Okay, between the third and fourth. And uh, as well as having a doorway in, uh, Nicole, when you were offline, Amy was sort of showing a proposed location for a door into the stairway on that top floor, which seemed to us like it would work. Yeah, my understanding is that we already have um, a plaster ceiling, which we will be replacing with gypsum on the, sec on the third floor second or third floor, whichever you want to call it. And then we could add a cementitious layer above to create the one hour rating for the floor assembly and add a door um, to create that one hour separation between the third floor or fourth floor and the second floor. Okay, is that good? Matt? Okay. That's good, that right? Is... I didn't catch a elevation okay. on that one. Well, we're assuming uh, it's a four story. Right, so it's so the first story fully above grade is more than six feet above grade plane. That's the right. on definition average. here. Yeah, and as Adam, so was I saying, take it that's well, already uh, been okay, determined. Here we are. Okay, <laughs> okay, here we go. So I see on the site plan that grade plane is listed as three twenty point nine two four three feet. I'm guessing that's obviously above sea level. <laughs> Above that, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> is are these dimensions listed in the uh, notated as like from datum on the elevation by any chance? Oh, they're not. They're not. They're they're not. <laughs> we, city, city. If Great have... Plain was listed there, that would clarify it immediately. We oh. have done this calculation with the code reviewer where we submitted a section with the average grade plane and the elevations listed at grade plane to review if it was a third or three or four story building and, and they determined it was four. Okay. Given the okay. Drawings call it the third. Is that so. uploaded with any of the documents to the prelim by any chance? Do you like remember if it was because I'm trying to find it. <laughs> I'm not sure Adam but if not then we can definitely um Right, so, either it's going to go back through a preliminary plan review, or you're going to do a full blown building permit application. But if it goes back pre preliminary plan review, you have to pr provide what you need to provide so they can do the calculation for AGL and then have everything we need at that stage or you know the, the full blown building permit. Right, application. But you're saying you already went through all this with uh, right. the plans examiner for the prelim. Yes. Uh, this one or the, or the previous one. Because there's been two. The previous. Okay, okay. That's why I'm not seeing it. I wasn't looking there. <laughs> um, Wayne, forgive me if I missed this. Did you say anything about the uh, LO uh, awful occupancy? Sign? No, we didn't. No, we didn't. You're right. No. But, uh, Matt or John? Could... Yeah. Do, typically, is one put on every floor, or is that only if you post an individual floor in uh, it can be i i've seen per room per floor and per building i think the masonic temple i remember reviewing that uh it's just one sign for the whole building so it can be whatever the board decides in this case well i guess yeah. well, well i guess you're not deciding about occupant loads right now uh well but we, we did when we, we wanted, had, uh, yeah we want to think posted is what they uh what they, we were told it was going to be there 
Uh, uh, the basement is 66 people, if it could be posted for that. First floor is 173. Correct. Second floor is 75. And the third floor is 29. That's what you expressed us with, with the uh, amount of people were there. If you could just post each floor or do you post it at 343 people? Does it? I'd like to see the fourth floor posted for 29. Yeah. And then maybe one on the entrance for the 343. Yeah. All right. If they're okay with it. You guys okay with that? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. And Bill, LO is lawful occupancy. <laughs> yes. Can I have just for my clarification as the non expert um, yeah. Zoom call that that with regard to the structure of the main staircase, which is one of the main historic features in the building, we may keep that staircase intact, um, installing these glass baffles and you know, with the provision of Amy, you had suggested a door in that location on the top floor, <laughs> um, um, which I mean, both of which seem very, you know, like great compromises and improvements to life safety that we're happy about. So I, I just want to make sure that I'm leaving the meeting with an understanding of um, what the decision of the committee is. You're right. Your decision, what your understanding is right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anything else? That concludes our business. May we please be excused? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Stop recording. Stop recording is right. <laughs>